During this very challenging time where we had to be forced to be separate from our friends and our colleagues, I was really grateful for this Anchor app, which has allowed me to continue the podcast after almost one year of working on it. Uh, It's free. You simply go to anchor.fm and download the app. And there you'll find all the tools that you need to record and edit your podcast, as well as to invite people onto your podcast through the app. Uh, Anchor also distributes the podcast for you on Apple, Spotify, and many other platforms. You have absolutely nothing to do except to record your podcast. Uh, If you have an ad like this, you can also make money. Uh, It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Uh, I would recommend it for anyone who wants to get their voice out there, has something to contribute, go for it. Anchor.fm is where you go to download the free app and to get started. Good luck with your podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Bees and Honey podcast. Today we're speaking with Simone de Puri and I really had a great time uh, speaking to Simone because he opens up about everything uh, that he is involved with in the art world. For people in the art world, he doesn't need much of an introduction, but if you're not specifically in the art world, uh, Simon has been an auctioneer, he's a DJ, he's a photographer, he's a curator, he's an advisor, he sells art privately. Um, He's really just an all-rounded, wonderful human being. And uh, I titled this Renaissance Man because in uh, many ways he is a Renaissance Man. Uh, In some ways old-fashioned, but in a lot of ways uh, just as contemporary as it gets. So enjoy this and uh, see you soon. Hello. Hi, Simon. How are oh, you? Oh, miracle. Oh, finally, it worked. Thank good morning. Yes, yeah, so good, good afternoon morning, for you. <laughs> I told you that I have uh, tech difficulties, but anyway, we made it. That's well, amazing. Well, I think, you know, first of all, you did an excellent job, considering that you've never used this app before. And, uh, you know, if you just eliminate that idea that you have technical difficulties, you'll be surprised to see there are no technical difficulties. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Anyway, so tell me what's going on besides uh, spending a few minutes with poor old Nicolette in New York. <laughs> Listen, it's lovely to speak to Nicolette. <laughs> yes. I haven't seen you for a while. How... I know. I'm sad mm-hmm. about that. Yes, it's been ages, ages. I think last time was in Miami. Well, I don't know if it was three years ago, but it was a while now. Are you still on? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, yes. Uh, if we get cut off, I will just uh, reconnect with you and then we'll uh, continue the discussion. Yes, yes. All right. So tell me, what are you? where are you now? I mean, I think I see from social media you're uh, hiding out in Monaco. I'm in Monaco at the moment. That's right. Where I have been, uh, you know, staying since the lockdown started. And uh, now Monaco has sort of reopened sort of two weeks ago where stores started to open first. And now uh, restaurants are partially opening and next week hotels. So, you know, life is gradually getting back to normal. But obviously we do know that the uh, virus is around. And so it's quite strange that a lot of people, you know, having been confined and very disciplined for a very long time, are so happy that it's summertime and uh, that they can go and get out that a lot of people are kind of half forgetting that the virus is still very much there. So it's kind of a, it's kind of an odd, odd situation. Well, that's what I said to a friend. The only thing that's changed is the weather. You know, it's not like the virus disappeared. <laughs> no, exactly. Yes. I, I saw some of my friends in uh, Cap d'Antibes. Uh, there's a little beach at the base of the hill uh, near the Hotel du Cap. And there were like 20 people cleaning up the beach. Nobody wearing masks, but everybody having a lot of fun. And I, I really missed it. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, anyway, so, but tell me, you, uh, Nicolette, you're... Uh, you're French or you're, because your name, uh, 
Um, yes. I mean, my story is a little complicated. I was yes. born in Trinidad. And, yes. Um, I moved to the U.S., Mm -hmm. And I was married to someone who's French, uh, an artist. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would, became French because I was married to him for a while. And uh, ah, okay, okay. I'm American because I live in America now almost uh, 30 years. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I, again, global citizens we are. That's right. Indeed. Yeah. And you were born in Basel. I was born in Basel, Switzerland. Exactly. Uh, yes. And then there. you lived, you lived in England. Uh, I've lived in Switzerland, in England, and, uh, you know, partially in New York. Uh, and um, uh, yes, and now since a year and a half in Monaco. And I mean, I've always been traveling nonstop. Uh, uh, when, when the lockdown started, that is possibly the first time that I stayed longer than uh, in, in the same place than two weeks at a time which is quite extraordinary because in, in the art world, we are all you know, leading very mobile lives. And yeah. um, so, but I must say, I quite enjoyed not catching a flight every second or third day. Or, and yes. it was quite nice to stay in one place. Now, obviously, after a while, you do get itchy and, <laughs> and one wants to you know, meet people and move, etc. Yes, well, I think uh, more than ever, we've come to realize how important our friends and colleagues and everyone who makes up our world is, you know, I mean, I, I miss even my art tribe. Some people who I couldn't even stand, I miss them. <laughs> yes. uh, anyway, uh, it makes us appreciate and uh, what, what we have and it makes us appreciate what's imp what is important in our lives. And we see what the true priorities are and what is truly essential. And, and in that sense, it's, it's a, a quite a, a, a sort of a wake up call. And, and um, uh, in, you know, while obviously the consequences are, are tragic and have been instantaneous for you know, people all over the world, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the fact that everybody, every single person has had this wake up call um, and, uh, is, is, is quite a, an extraordinary situation, which, which has never happened before, because it's really a, a, a global phenomenon. And, uh, and there are like in every you know, crisis, there, there, there are some positive elements. And, and yes, yes. Well, I heard this. Um, uh... Instagram live that you had with I forget the guy's name from Aquazura. Yes, Edgardo uh, Osorio. Yes. He's yeah, great. I mean, I really wish I had been able to do that interview with you because he covered so many things and I just loved hearing the whole story about your life, which I really didn't know anything about before for the most part. I just kind of take you as a fixture of the art world and never question your existence, like how you got there or anything. But um for example, I love hearing the story about Baylor and stuff like that because I never met him. And uh, tell us about Basel. Like, how is Basel such an art city? Like, what makes Basel so special? You know, we're not having the art fair this year. So, again, we have something to miss. So, tell us how it was growing up there and yes. why is it a big art place? Uh, Basel is, on the, is a Swiss uh, city on the border... <laughs> Uh, of uh, France, Germany, and Switzerland. So it, it is where these three countries meet. And in mm -hmm. fact, the airport is, uh, covers the three, the three countries. And uh, in that sense, Basel has always been a very open-minded uh, city. And uh, culture has always played a key role in Basel. Uh, the earliest museum in Europe uh, was in, in Basel. It was the a uh, cabinet of curiosities. It was called the Amabach cabinet, which was bought by the city council. The city council decided to buy that collection and to make it publicly uh, accessible. And in so doing, they created the first museum anywhere in, in Europe. And uh, then uh, always culture has played a key role in, in the city's life. And I was a teenager in the 1960s, and in uh, in the mid 60s, there was 
a uh, plane crash of a uh, charter uh, company, Globert, and the owner of that company had inherited a very, very important collection of paintings, and he was not able to uh, pay the damages uh, to, to the families uh, uh, that had perished in that accident. And so he had to sell some paintings that he had inherited. He initially sold a major Van Gogh painting to Walter Annenberg, who in those days was possibly the biggest collector worldwide. And mm -hmm. uh, subsequently, he decided he wanted to sell two important Picassos. One was the Sitting Harlequin of 1921, and the other one was the Two Brothers, where you see from the pink period of Picasso, where you see uh, two naked boys, uh, a, a boy uh, carrying his little brother on his shoulders. And so both major masterworks in Picasso's life. And when it became apparent that he was trying to sell those two paintings, the city decided that they did not want those paintings that were on loan to the museum to leave Basel. So they d decided they wanted to buy the two paintings. And like in Switzerland, everything, <laughs> every decision uh, it gets voted on. So there was a referendum and uh, strong opposition to the government paying a lot of money for paintings and said, no, this money should not go uh, buying artworks. This money should go towards building hospitals and so on. And so mm -hmm. a vote took place and the whole city was mobilized for that. And the governors of the city dressed up as Harlequins and there was a big thermometer mm -hmm. on the museum and everybody had to you know, collaborate and, 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 and mm -hmm. uh, co contribute to that campaign. And in the end, the population overwhelmingly uh, decided to buy those two paintings. And when Picasso heard of that, he was so thrilled that he invited the director of the museum and gave him another three major works. So just to show there is something in the DNA of this city <laughs> that yes, uh, yes, culture yes. was always the highest thing on the on the scale of importance and priorities. And then uh, Ernst Beiler, who was possibly the most important uh, dealer of his generation, he was really uh, number one in Impressionist and modern paintings. And uh, he had his little gallery in the old town of Basel. And the top collectors from all over the world would come and see him. And eventually he was a co-founder of Art Basel which was not the first art fair. I think Cologne was, was the first art fair in uh, Europe. And then Basel and Cologne were you know, competing for a while. And then Art Basel has become you know, what it is, which is really mm -hmm. the fair. So there are endless things which make Basel kind of a, a place, despite its size, that has had a lot of impact in, in the art world. And I think had I not grown up in Basel, maybe I would not have gotten so passionate about art because as a kid, my mother would take me to the amazing museums in Basel and that awoke a uh, real you know, passion and interest for, for art and culture in general. Yes, uh, well, I am uh, very grateful that uh, Basel has made so many amazing people like you. I, I know a few other people from Basel who are all across the world and they do such good work in so many ways. Um, I don't know if you know uh, Serge Becker in New York. Serge Becker was the guy who started the Bowery Bar. He had La Esquina, Miss Lilies, and uh, anyway, he's, he's an amazing person from Basel as well. He, did, he moved to New York and he was making uh, music videos like for Madonna and stuff in the 1980s. Anyways, next time you come, maybe uh, you'll meet him. I would love he to meet some him. Art stuff uh, yeah, he, yeah. he sounds amazing. Yes. Yeah. He's now at the Museum of Sex. So that's kind of funny too. Uh, yes. <laughs> in New York. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So tell me again, um, you know, you did a lot of different things with art over the years. And most recently, uh, there was that groundbreaking case. Can you talk about that or no? I mean, it's all over the newspapers in the past years. So I don't know. Oh, yes. Might be no, I mean... Uh, I have in my 
many, many years in the art market, uh, sold a lot of artworks, uh, most of them at auction, having been an auctioneer now for 50 years. But I also have done a lot of private transactions and uh, I've been very fortunate to do some major private transactions in my uh, life. Now, uh, the thing about private transactions is that they're private as much as a public auction is very public. And so uh, mm -hmm. prices and circumstances get a lot of coverage. The opposite is the case with private transactions. Now, this, uh, you are referring to one private transaction that did not remain private uh, for disappointing reasons in a way, because uh, this is a work that was uh, consigned, uh, I was, uh, that I arranged a private transaction between the vendor, who was a school friend of mine <laughs> from Basel, and the, uh, and the purchasers, and, um, and then the transaction took place. It was at the time the second most uh, expensive painting ever sold. And uh, it, it's a masterwork by Paul Gauguin, Tahitian painting. I, I think if you had to make a list of Gauguin's top five works, this would definitely be part of it. And mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the, the transaction was completed and, and so on. And then the, my friend decided that he did not want to pay me the commission that we had agreed on. And um, so I, for the very first time, I had to sue him and <laughs> something in, that I never had to do. I'd never had to sue anybody in, in all of these years in the business. And so... It, well, your friend was not a gentleman. Well, I, I don't want to comment on that, but uh, <laughs> he, he, he was my friend. And uh, I actually, prior to that, spent, you know, some... Uh, some memorable time with him. And so I had no choice literally than suing him. And, and this was a very lengthy process. It took uh, three and a half years. And then there was, uh, uh, it went to court. Then uh, I, I won in court and then he, he made an appeal. And then it lasted another two years. So the whole thing lasted five and a half years. And then the appeal I won again. And now the thing is, is, is final, final. So it, it was five and a half years. And um, yes, so, so it's sad in a way because I don't wish the experience to anybody because when you, when you are in a court battle, you constantly have to deal with the past instead of dealing with the present and the future. And uh, it's never a healthy thing to focus on your past uh, too much and um, but obviously I was uh, very relieved and happy with the outcome and I think a lot of colleagues were very grateful to me because it was about a an oral agreement that we had reached and a lot of agreements in the art market uh, are done on an oral basis first. Obviously, once you've reached an oral agreement, then subsequently uh, a contract is made and, and the contract then reflects the oral agreements that you've had. But anyway, uh, again, as I said, <laughs> I like to look to the future or to the present and yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful that it's behind me and um, and also, you know, in, in, in life, uh, you've got to forgive and but not forget. So I, I'm not forgetting, yes. but uh, I have not seen him since the second second yes. uh, the court appointment took place. But if I saw him, you know, I would be perfectly happy to say hello to him and, and so on. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that's the thing. You know, in America, suing is perfectly normal. But when I talk about gentlemen, you know, the gentleman's agreement is something that we really take seriously in the art world. And it's sad to lose a friend at the end of the day. It's sad to lose a friend like that. But thank you for sharing the story. I think it's really important. Right. <laughs> so let's talk about fun stuff then. So okay. The DJing. Tell me about the DJing. The DJing. So um, I guess all 
all my passions all have to do with uh, what I liked when I was a teenager. So when I grew up in the 60s in Basel, this was the time of uh, big stars like the, the Rolling Stones, uh, Jimi Hendrix, the Beatles, uh, Bob Dylan, etc. Um, and I was, it, you cannot even begin to imagine the impact of listening to that music. It was something extraordinary. It, it went way beyond the impact of the music itself. It was, it was like a kind of a revolution uh, uh, for, for boys to have long hair was a rebellious act and I was for the first time saw a photograph of the Rolling Stones and it was something like like a shock man I said my god this is amazing you cannot imagine it today <laughs> and it was very very expensive to buy an, an album a vinyl album so they, they were costing uh, 25 francs Swiss francs then I mean the equivalent of $25 today uh, and back then in the 60s so it, it you basically had to exchange records between friends or uh, you know <laughs> try to, try to get some being given to you on your birthday or at christmas and when you had an album you would listen to it over and over and over and over again uh, until the vinyl was nearly gone your needle of, of the uh, record player was nearly gone and so you <laughs> it, it, you cannot imagine the impact it had on on and growing up so the whole, my whole use is in a way, I felt it through music, through, through songs that you experience. And, and music mm -hmm. and smell are the two only sensations that bring you back in time to the precise moment when you heard, when a smell can do that. If you suddenly smell right. something that you haven't smelled for years and years, it brings you straight back to the very, very minute you've, you've smelt that for the first time. And same thing with music. Amazing. When you when you hear a, a song again, it brings you to the precise moment when you've heard that music for the first time. So um, now, uh, my, then the third thing, of course, was, was besides art and music was was uh, football. I was obsessed with, with European football, soccer. And um, effectively, none of these things ever went away. So whatever interest I had as a teenager, I continued and followed. So uh, in the same way that art never stops, music never stops. Football did stop now during Corona, but is luckily starting again. And, and so by following you all the time, you you remain current in it. But when I, while I was very, very lucky to uh, be able to make a living out of my passion for art, uh, my passion for music was purely a hobby. And then something like uh, 12 years ago, 13, 14 years ago, I thought it's a shame because I, I never played a musical instrument, sadly. I had my two older brothers were very, very talented musicians. They never had had any lessons. And so my parents thought, oh, um, let's give the youngest son some uh, piano lessons. And this was traumatizing. I had a piano teacher. She was, uh, 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 how do you call it, beating my hands with a, with a ruler. Uh, when I would hit a bad note, she would hit, hit me on my fingers with that ruler. So that was enough to disgust me from continuing having music <laughs> lessons. So I thought the yeah. next best thing is to become a DJ. Uh, and I just decided one day I want to become a DJ. And I told my, my uh, adults, my four adult, adult children, that I was going to do a DJ gig in uh, Berlin. And they thought, oh, my God, this is so embarrassing. And <laughs> This is a very <laughs> acute uh, late life crisis of our father. Anyhow, but so I did DJ, um, or, or DJing is a big word for it. I, I did sort of imitate being a DJ. And uh, then I could see that my four kids were dancing away. And I, so afterwards, I went to them. They said, well, you're, you're very embarrassed, but not sufficiently not to dance. And subsequently, <laughs> now they find it find it cool. Anyway, so it is. 
to to DJ is in a way a very uh, creative act in the same way that collecting can be a very creative act because it's editing. Uh, a collector is an editor. Uh, somebody who posts on Instagram is an editor. Uh, we all we have all become yeah. artists. We have all become musicians. We all have all become editors. And so it's something I enjoy very much. And every week I listen to the new music coming out. Uh, I love hip hop. I love rock. I love, uh, you know, dance music of any kind, uh, mm -hmm. Latin music, mm -hmm. uh, film music, uh, also a little bit of classical music. I mean, everything. And um, yeah. it's... Well, the, the proof is in the dancing. The fact that they dance tells you you were DJing and DJing well. So you don't well, have to question the, it. If yes. they were that's the similarity with auctioneering, you see? Because when yes. if you do really very poorly as an auctioneer, I mean, you pretty much get the feeling while you're up there. And uh, same thing as a DJ. <laughs> if people leave the dance floor, they say, uh-oh, there's something I've got to do to get them back onto the floor. So you've got to be totally... Ad it in tune with your audience and that's where i see a great similarity between djing and auctioneering yes well if you need to go let me know i just wanted to ask you a couple more questions but if you no no, no i don't run, have to run just, don't uh, worry. let me okay great well i was going to ask you next about your photography because i haven't really seen uh, much of it but uh, you do some photographs as well yes i i, I love uh, taking photographs I mean, in, in the very hectic lives we, we lead, uh, the only way we can kind of record what we see and experience is through photography. And the 18th century travelers would always take their little notepads and would do sketches and do drawings wherever they would go. And so photography is, that's what it is. It's kind of a visual memory that you you develop. And the other wonderful thing about uh, photography, it's uh, suspension of time. I mean, you, you catch a, a, a moment and that moment then re remains suspended in time. And that's the absolute fascination of, of photography. And um, now that everybody is glued to their phones, looking at uh, social media, looking at <laughs> images all the time. So everybody is, yeah. is a photographer in a way. But I've done yeah. some photography exhibitions in uh, Geneva, in Berlin, in Paris. At Paris, I did it at Colette. There was this very cool. I love was, that place. They're sadly, like no it. longer there, but it, it, was, it was an amazing yeah. place. And so they plastered mm -hmm. all the walls with my photographs. And I actually also DJed in, in the store. <laughs> oh, it was, wow. It was fun. And then I had a show of my photography at the MAM, which is the Multimedia Art Museum in uh, Moscow. Olga Sviblova, the director of that museum, had asked me to, to do a show. And I had one floor, which was really very, very exciting. And I hope to be wow. doing a show at the Leica Gallery in London, uh, I think, sometime next year. Perfect. Well, I will definitely uh, look out for that. And tell us what you're doing with this uh, Newlands house in Petworth, West Sussex. So I was approached uh, last year by the uh, owners of that uh, house. Newlands house is the Georgian house in the middle of a little village called Petworth in West Sussex. Uh, I had actually never been there before. And I was under the charm, not only of Petworth, the village, but of the whole area. It is a beautiful area, the, uh, it's stunning landscapes, very well preserved. So it hasn't been really damaged in any way. And uh, their, their wish was to do exhibitions in that uh, house. So as this year is the centennial of Helmut Newton's birth, I thought it would be great to do a homage exhibition to Helmut Newton. And so pu I put together an exhibition with 100 works uh, by Helmut Newton. And the exhibition opened in early March. It, it, was, it is stunning and it was very well received. But after three weeks of uh, the exhibition had to close for the reasons that we all know. Oh, yes. And now yes. we're waiting to hear what the security or, or health guidelines rather uh, are going to say when when it can open. We we hope to be open uh, to reopen fairly soon, and have prolonged the exhibition up to the end of August, 
so that the public will still have the chance of seeing it uh, uh, be before it closes then. And meanwhile, uh, through Instagram and through uh, our respective uh, websites, we have asked friends of uh, Helmut Newton to speak about him. And so we had uh, Michael Chow, uh, so far uh, Mary McCartney, um, today it's Grace Coddington, the uh, former creative director of Vogue, and we have some mm -hmm. exciting people coming up, and so that even people who cannot go and see the exhibition can get a feeling of uh, about Helmut Newton, and also we've done a kind of an online exhibition so that people can experience it even if they can't go uh, to West Sussex. Yes. Well, um, I had another question, uh, which I think is interesting. Uh, who would you say was the number one influence for what you do now in your life? Like who helped you find this path? Uh, I mean, there are three men who I have sort of have been kind of mentors in my life or in, in the earlier part of my life. And I owe them mm -hmm. to all three of them a great debt of gratitude. Uh, one we've mm -hmm. already mentioned, that is Ernst Beiler, uh, this dealer mm -hmm. that we, we spoke about earlier, who, mm -hmm. who I went to see and uh, asked for advice. And he <laughs> sort of told me that he felt I should become an art dealer. And mm -hmm. the uh, second person is Peter Wilson. Peter Wilson was the chairman of Sotheby's. He became chairman of Sotheby's in 1959. And the whole art world, mm -hmm. as we know it today, is the result of his vision. He was a total visionary bef before the English auction houses were uh, auction houses where the trade would go and buy, but private individuals would not go and buy there. And they were fairly local. They did not have this international mm -hmm. footprint that they have today. He's the first person to introduce the currency converter. Uh, he's the first person to publicize the sales very heavily. He's the first uh, person to uh, create this whole network uh, globally. Uh, he bought Park Burnett, which was the main auction company in the States, which then from one day to another uh, made Sotheby's not only the, the number one in in London, but also the number one in New York. Um, I'm speaking of the 60s and uh, and so on and so on. So, and he was very passionate about art. So I, I was, he was a kind of a role model in many ways. And then the third person was Baron Thiessen. Uh, when I was 27, Baron Thiessen asked me to leave Sotheby's and to become curator of his collection. Uh, in those days, he was the, probably the biggest collector worldwide and so this was the, the chance of my life the luck of my life and uh, I learned a lot uh, working for him and, and with him but uh, again it was his character I think that was inspiring because he was a very generous man a very passionate person and uh, also had a great sense of humor so I, I would say these are the three people who who I looked up to in, in the early stages of my professional life. And still today, I um, very often think of what they did generally and, and, and of course, uh, what they did for me. Yes, and in terms of um, your kids, you said you had four big kids. Does that include your... your no, I have five kids, children. I have five children. I have five. four yeah. fully grown ones. <laughs> and one yes. uh, nine-year-old daughter. So Yes, well, I think I remember you saying that she was showing you something on TikTok or something like that. So you somehow keep up to date with the developments through your young Oh, one. totally. It, it is wonderful to have uh, young children because they do keep you so current. And so, yes, she did introduce me to TikTok. Also, uh, <laughs> she has very, you know, s specific musical tastes. So I do listen to uh, mm -hmm. her playlists and all of that. And uh, it's very, very interesting. And also seeing her, the, the world through her eyes and uh, now how she's reacted by what's going on um, with the corona, what's going on now with, with you know, the 
the horrendous things uh, we've we, we've we've seen now over the last uh, uh, ten days and yes. all of that. Uh, she follows this very very closely, and it, it is it is yes. actually wonderful to be able to dis- speak about these things with with a child of her age, and um, uh, also it gives you a lot of hope when you see how. Uh, children of that age react absolutely i mean they are they every day i look at my son and i think the same you know they're the most beautiful things and if we just help them maintain that we'll have a beautiful world <laughs> yes. you know I, I, indeed yes so I think on that note i mean if there's anything else you want to add specifically you can let me know um I do not know. Um, n- no, I mean, whatever. Uh, I, I don't have any brilliant ideas yeah. now, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think at the first week of... Um, I think the first week of July, there's going to be something in Paris, like a weekend of art or stuff like that. Yes. Uh, be able to get over there, and I'll let you know uh, if I do. Ah, great. Let okay. me know. Yes, yes. And tell me, you are born on, on November 21st. Yes, I, I was born not? November 21st. Yes, yes. Uh, I think the same day as you. I do think about eagles. If someone asks me what animal, the first thing that comes to mind is an eagle. Oh, really? Ah, that, funny. Yeah, it, yes, it yes. was funny. When you when Edward, you asked Eduardo that question, or Edgardo, I immediately thought about an eagle for some reason. It came to mind. And then afterwards, uh, you guys mentioned that as well as... It is funny because he is the first person where both the animal he chose and I can't remember what my other question was. Um, I think you asked him um, what? I did not ask him the sign of zodiac, but... No, he... Oh, no, if he had to define himself by one word, um, he answered passion, yes. and which is the word that I would have chosen uh, myself. What, what is the word that you would choose for well, yourself? Well, you know, I can't remember what I thought at the time, but it was something related to passion. But when, when you said passion, I thought to myself, typical Scorpio. And then when, <laughs> and, and then when you asked about the, you know, the eagle is also a sign of Scorpio. So that was sort of interesting as well, too. Oh, I didn't know that it's linked to Scorpio yeah, as well. The, yes. the idea yes. of regeneration and uh, soaring above things and, uh, the phoenix, the phoenix rising, which is uh, in some ways, I guess. Oh, yeah. yes, yes. Anyways, well, I think, you know, we'll have another discussion about esoteric stuff like that. Uh, thank you for spending this time with me. And uh, Not at yeah. all. How old is your son my now? Son, how, how old my is son this? is now uh, four. He's going to be five in October. Uh, he was supposed to be a Scorpio, but um, I had a very high blood the pre so cl- close to the time of his birth two weeks before they said uh, in order to make sure he's healthy we better get him out now uh, ah, because the yes, blood yes, pressure yes. might affect him so, so which yeah, date so is he, he out, october he's, which he's date? october 19th so he's a libra ah yes well libra is also a very yeah. good sign yes yes oh he's 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 just he's 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 so i mean you know i named him theodore because it means gift of god god's gift Yes, yes. He came yes. late in my life and I really felt he was a gift. And his middle name is Love because his uh, paternal grandmother's name, last name was Love. So I named him God's Gift Love. And he's proven to be exactly that. He you see, really, that's fantastic. He's, he's, he's an angel. He's really gift of God love in my life. <laughs> and you see, the, the name you give is very, very important. So that, that will shape all his life. That's fantastic. Absolutely. I figured I'd give him a, a hands up when he meets the girl. He'll have a great line to start a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> my name's Love, <laughs> baby. <laughs> Anyways, that's great. Uh, Fantastic. Anyway, all right. Off to the future. Off to the present and future. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. So let me know when you'll be here. That, that's fantastic. I will. Okay. Take care. You be too. Well. Okay, all bye. the best. Bye. 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 Take, take care. care. Bye. Mm.
Thank you for joining us again for this episode of the Bees and Honey podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Stay well, stay safe, take care of each other, and see you again next week.